another generation of songwriters and, and artists. And uh, the book that they have put together, uh, which we'll be talking about today, offers a really interesting and inspiring and insightful, sometimes heartbreaking look at that movement. And uh, I, for one, cannot be more excited to talk to them about it today, so I hope you are too. Without any further ado, please help me and welcome you up to the stage, Mr. John Doe. Thank you much. Um, glad you were willing to spend part of your Saturday here. And that uh, the two Dans were willing to help me out. Enablers, some people call them guides, some people call them enablers. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a bunch of different uh, chapters written by uh, people that were there and um, kind of gives a, a, a bigger a scope to it, and uh, I'll just read a chapter here, and then Dan will come back up, we'll talk, and then have some questions from the audience. Uh, as we were starting this, uh, kind of in the middle of, of doing this process, we contacted Chip Kinman, who was in a band in San Francisco called The Dills, and then kind of reinvented himself as a, a member of Rank and File. His brother Tony played in both of those bands, and at the time, Tony got sick, of uh, cancer and, and was kind of going down pretty quick. So Chip and Tony um, kind of wrote his chapter together and at that time I, I realized that uh, the, the phrase fallen soldiers came into our, uh, you know, the, an idea. And so <clears throat> this, this chapter is called Fallen Soldiers. Fallen Soldiers? We didn't even know that we were in an army, with, that we were an army or in some kind of war. It had been a war of attrition, where the punk rockers or those associated with punk had not fared well. We all had different reasons for being in the trenches, but all did it with fire and blood, for it's a life that can beat you down, drink by drink, tour by tour, gig by gig, until even the blur gets blurry. The lifestyle becomes addicting, and then the addiction creeps up behind you. Puts its arm around, puts its arms around you in a warm, tight embrace, and it becomes one very long night on a nationwide and then worldwide tour. But regardless of the value, the scale, or goal of the campaign, all the players deserve recognition and honor. And not just because they were there, but because for some time, long or short, they influenced or inspired someone. The early deaths, like Darby Crash, Dee Boone, and Exene's sister Muriel, made us deeper with sadness and hardened us and hardened us against what we hoped could be a long career that included the occupational hazard of living a hard, fast, and loud life. Some of us, like Country Dick Montana, Jeffrey Lee Pierce, and Top Jimmy, chose lifestyle over life and checked out after many battles, a few victories, and too many losses. But what the rest of us couldn't have anticipated was the long haul. What happens after the first, after the first blush fades? You don't measure up to either someone else's or your own standards. The money goes up, sometimes way up, and then it stagnates or comes down, sometimes way down. But our contributions grew from our collective effort through songwriting, gigs, words, touring, images through photos, movies, poster, art, performance art, radio play, and dedication to search for a different way to say, to say something that might already have been said. Early on, we knew that some of us like Jeffrey Lee, Texacala Jones from Tex and the Horseheads, Dee Dee Troy from UXA or Top Jimmy would struggle. Maybe they'd make it, but probably not. Tex and Dee Dee are thankfully still with us. We accepted the adage that sometimes the wages of sin are death. But some of us were and are still determined to fight the good fight. And maybe somewhere down the line, we'd be rec recognized as doers who stood for something. Though the music may have been far apart, no, 
So right, here is where the roots rockers and hardcore stand together. Though the music may have been far apart, the desire to offer an alternative to the blandness unified us and gave respect to the music that started the whole punk rock thing in Los Angeles five years prior. Finding origins can be tricky, and everyone, I mean everyone, wants to point to their contemporaries as ground zero. Thousands and thousands of music lovers may not know Lone Justice, Rank and File, or Green on Red, but it's likely they've heard of Nico Case, the Avid Brothers, and Wilco. They may not have listened to the Gun Club or House of Freaks, but they sure as shit know who the White Stripes are. Or, if not for the big boys from Texas and Fishbone, who knows if Funk would have found such a heavy core in the Red Hot Chili Peppers or No Doubts mix. Your basic punk rocker may not have Flipper or Circle Jerks on their playlists, but they can probably name half a dozen Green Day or Rancid songs. I'm not saying that those who came later than these pioneers I've mentioned did anything sneaky or underhanded. They simply got inspired and moved the needle forder forward with their version of a musical continuum, which is twisted music for people who feel a little more twisted than your casual consumer. What Nico, Jack White, Billy Joe, and Jeff Tweedy have in common is they all got inspired by some kind of music that included the scene called cowpunk or Paisley Underground, or Hardcore. Then maybe they went back even farther to find the originators, and then turned it into Americana, alt country, punk funk, country, or truly financially successful punk rock. The soldiers from the 80s worked hard, played hard, toured hard, drank hard, partied hard, or sometimes just sat around and did nothing but dream and drink and fuck off. But they tried, and they did something. Some, like Tomato De Plenty and Biscuit Turner, enjoyed successful second acts as fine artists. Warning, warning. <laughs> uh, some, like Tomato De Plenty, Biscuit Turner, enjoyed successful second acts as fine artists and received the attention that their bands, the Screamers <coughs> and Big Boys, deserved. Others are still with us, like Mike Ness, Jane Weedlin, Penelope Houston, Dave Alvin, and Maria McKee moved forward, with, moved forward with solo careers, and some of them concurrently held down straight jobs. Regardless of whether they stuck around, checked out, stuck with it, or changed directions, they all deserve honor, and congratulations for taking that emotional, creative, and physical risk. They all deserve credit for where they went and how. Credit for all the crappy, cold dressing rooms or hot, bubbly audiences 10 times better and bigger than they expected. Credit for the hundreds and thousands of miles, day and night, riding in vans, saying stupid or brilliant shit to people you've known forever or have just met. Credit for getting paid less and still sending money home or being stupid and just blowing it on cowboy boots that don't even fit right. <laughs> Credit for setting up and tearing down the stage and loading and standing by the gear so it doesn't get stolen. Credit for carrying on when all your shit does get stolen and strangers from another band or a music store lend instruments so the songs get played that night. Credit for all the shitty border crossings where everything you have with you is pulled out and scattered across the parking lot and you're strip searched in cold exam rooms. Yay. <laughs> <clears throat> Credit for still paying attention and writing down a phrase that becomes a chorus. For sliding across and spinning around 360 degrees through two or three highway lanes on ice and snow. Credit for fighting off the blackness. When a bitter reviewer says that your last performance or record was inspired and this one wasn't. Or, when the insipid A&R guy says, can't you write more songs like Wild Thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Credit for the band who never really leaves their hometown, but breathes fire for two or three years. Credit for simply putting up with all the transcendent moments and complete bullshit that invariably happen in rapid succession. 
Nowadays, when the news arrives that another comrade has crossed over, I greet it with a tight grimace <clears throat> and a light shake of my head and go on with my day. But the shadow lingers. That small sadness makes a little pocket inside with, the all, with all the other brave soldiers who went down before. And I'm grateful for those of us who are still here to sing another old or new song. Still here to tell an old or new story and to continue to be brave for those coming up behind us. Help me out, Dan. Help me out. <laughs> Well, uh, I just had a few questions. I was able to read through a good portion of this book, couldn't make it through all of it, but um, uh, really interesting and wonderful to get these stories and learn more about these artists uh, directly from them through written word. Um, but when you set out to, to make this, and this is, a, you know, a, in many ways a sequel to, to Under the Black Sun, and picks up right where it left off. But when you set out to put this together and cover the, the years that followed that, what, what were you hoping to find? What sort of stories, what sort of themes were you hoping to find in reaching out to those artists to, to help you with this book? Well, uh, Tom DeSavia, who's my co-writer, author, um, it was kind of the beginning of his musical development because he's about 10 years younger than me. So he kind of entered the scene in 82. Uh, the first book was 77 to 82. This is 82 to 87. So uh, <clears throat> one of his favorite bands was Lone Justice, Maria McKee, um, great singer, really young when she came on the scene, and a Christian too, like 16, 17 years old, didn't know nothing. And uh, <clears throat> so he, he definitely we knew that we wanted to include her because she was pushed into the limelight so, uh, so fast, um, and and Tom's idea was that well someone is going to write your story, so wouldn't you rather it be you? And and so for the most part, people were very uh, generous with their time and, and effort and stuff like that. So we hope to you know as it started out we had, it was like sex and drugs and rock and roll, and um, you know the community that was really. Uh, beautiful and, and kind of innocent from 77 to say 1980, was starting to fray at the edges by 81, 82, hardcore was coming in, people were getting signed to major labels and going on tour, and so you can't maintain a community with, if you're gone. And so the community was breaking up, it was becoming something else, and, and um, I explained this to my um, partner, and she said, that sounds horrible. <laughs> it sounds like a book I wouldn't want to read, and like, what the fuck, you know? So then I said, okay, smarty pants, what, what do we do? You know, and she said, well, you influence a lot of people. <clears throat> so that's the other side of this book. There's plenty of sex and drugs and rock and roll and heartbreak and cautionary tales, but there's also, we included people that were in, influenced or inspired like Tony Hawk and Allison Anders and uh, Tim Robbins and Shepard Barry and, and Bill Morgan, uh, who like filmmakers and you know artists and things like that. So it does have sort of a happy ending. It wasn't like, and then Motley Crue won. It's <laughs> 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 terrible. I don't even think their, their name appears, which is nice. Uh, maybe intentional. <laughs> Um, in, in, in exploring the ideas um, and in reading through what people put together, were you surprised by any of the, any common themes that you saw and in, in some of the things that were written by people who, who played during that time? Uh, well, I was surprised at, at a lot of details. I didn't, I didn't say, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, I think for people like myself who never lived there and only know Los Angeles from what we see in television, uh, you know, what we hear about or when we visit, uh, I imagine that the Los Angeles you saw was a lot different than what I have in my mind uh, <laughs> yeah. in, in 76. So I, I, I was hoping to hear from you a little bit more about, about what that was like there when you moved there and, and what struck you about the area. Oh, uh, well, I mean, I wanted to get out of the East Coast. I knew that. And a friend of mine and I went to 
LA in March or April of 76. I moved there in October because um, I was just tired of Baltimore. I mean, you can't, you can't, uh, everyone was kind of negative and, and oh, you can't do that and cynical, which is good. You know, so being sarcastic and cynical is, uh, you know, one of the cornerstones of being a punk rock uh, person. Uh, and that's, but I mean, it was just cheap. It was cheap as hell to live, and it was it was like easy, and and there was it was. Uh, I think it still exists because I know some young people that live in LA, and and it's more expensive. But you can, if you live in a certain area, you can kind of stay local in that area, whether it's uh, you know Echo Park or Silver Lake or or um, Boyle Heights and stuff like that, and. Um, you could access a bohemian lifestyle, which is what I really wanted to do. I didn't, you know, I knew like punk rock was cool, and and I was a musician, so let's try for that. You know? yeah. um, but I, that was one of the reasons that that in Under the Big Black Sun that we wanted to have chapters and not an oral history because in Please Kill Me and we got the neutron bomb. Um, it's a lot of people calling, you know, Lex McNeil will call somebody up and say, hey, remember when Dee Dee did this crazy thing? And they go, blah, 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 blah. And there's no fact checking, which is cool because there's, you know, this is urban myth and, and this is what you remember of the thing, of the situation. But um, you don't get a, you get a, something of a sense of what New York was like at the time. But I, Los Angeles played a huge part in the development and the kind of general freedom that we felt. So I wanted to have LA as being a character, and if you're writing a chapter, then you got to ch tell like where you, oh, where was that? You know, I had to say to Robert Lopez, you know, well, you drove up to LA. What kind of a car was it? You know, because he didn't see. We just drove up. You know, it's like, well, what did you drive up in? <laughs> you know, so you give people. So, you know, we had a little bit of that writers 101 bullshit. And I'm sure uh, the answer to this question is going to be a lot of what you just described there, but can you point to anything else culturally or socially significant about Los Angeles during that time that was such fertile ground for all of these artists that came out of that area at the time? Well, mostly the, the Latino um, uh, culture. And, and that goes into, I mean, that applies to the, the period of this book. You know, the audience had gotten big enough you know, in 76, there were 150 people that would go to a show, and all of them were in bands or made a band scene or something like that. And then by 82, there was 6,000 people. So you could have these different genres breaking off, you know, like there was a ska um, genre, there was cowpunk, there was Paisley Underground, there was hardcore. There was, you know, art bands, which we didn't really go into the art bands. We didn't really go into the ska bands, but there were, you know, a handful of them. There was this whole mod scene, and and so people could just sort of go to what attracted them. And, and you know, luckily the L.A. Times embraced it, said, you know, there's a, there's a band out there that you're going to love. Just go find it. You know, there's eight or ten different venues. Go. It's there, you know. You don't just have to go to the Megadome and be a little ant up in the top rafters. So I would say that, yeah, that the the culture, uh, the the history of L.A. And there's a lot of innovation that comes out of the West Coast because it's like, well, fuck it. Who says you can't do it? You know, and that's kind of a general attitude. Sure, great. Well, you mentioned it before. Uh, I was really inspired by the the chapters written by Tony Hawk and Tim Robbins. Uh, you know, I think we, we can all say with certainty that there were a lot of musicians that were inspired by um, the Los Angeles punk rock movement, but it, uh, those chapters really show how it, it extended beyond that and affected people in non-musical disciplines. Um, can you think of any reason why that might be, and can you see, <coughs> what, uh, can you think of anything that you would think is particularly punk rock about what they did and what they talked about in the book? Uh, just the DIY um, freedom. I mean, if there are two things that I that that kind of music is, is about, it's freedom, and and, and that exists today. Um, you know, punk rock is kind of a underground uh, subculture. You know, lowriders and and uh, 
you know, weightlifters or, or uh, you know, things like that. So right now there's plenty of like punk rock shows that it's all ages. There's five bands that cost, cost 10 bucks to get in. Some kid gets a black eye and then they go back to school and say, dude, I went to the punk rock show. It was awesome. You know? <laughs> Beto O'Rourke was in a sort of punk rock band. <laughs> he was. He drove around Texas in a fucking station wagon with uh, Cedric and, and um, I can't remember his brother's name, who were in, at the drive in a great band. Um, so it's, it's everywhere. But I just think that music, <clears throat> because it's a little more, um, it, it doesn't have as much of a structure. Uh, you know, as an actor, you have to get somebody to give you a job. Or you have to find other actors and say, we're going to put on a play. And then you feel like, you know, Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland are like, we're going to, mom's going to make the scenery, you know. It's, like, <laughs> it's, it's lame. But if you're in a band or you're a musician, you can just go and play somewhere. You can play at a bar. And if you're any, if you're any good, you know, then some people will come and say, hey, you know, it's that guy with the, you know, shirt on, he's good, and you should go see him, he's playing every Friday, you know. So I think that that led the way for um, indie distribution of films, uh, you know, street art and, and stuff like that, because it's, there's a, you know, let's fuck some shit up kind of attitude towards it. And with Allison Anders, you know, at the point they graduated from UCLA film school, the film um, industry was saying, like, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. We've got our rebels, you know, with Martin Scorsese and Francis Ford Coppola and, and uh, you know, Dennis Hopper and, you know, all those people, or John Cassavetes, you know, and Gina Rollins and people like that. It's like, you know, just no thanks. And they said, well, what? what? I wanna, I'm, I'm going to make a movie, and I've got two kids and a single mom, and I'm gonna make a movie. And they're gonna be asleep on the floor while I'm editing this son of a bitch. <laughs> so just watch me. And, and that was, you know, really the first, uh, the first time I had an uh, opportunity to work in, you know, a, a movie. I don't know if it was a real movie, but I saw it <laughs> recently, and it was actually, it looks great. Sort of holds together as a movie. And so they took that thing, like, you can't do that, and oh, really? Well, watch me. And, and that's a great thing to pass on. Great. Um, so Top Jimmy is something of a mythical character throughout a lot of these, these stories. And um, you very lovingly uh, tell a lot of those stories about him. Um, uh, frankly, I didn't know much about him until reading, reading the book. Um, but I, I was hoping to hear more about who he was and maybe if, you, if you're comfortable sharing one of your favorite stories about him. Uh, well, I mean, we... Top Jimmy was a uh, blues singer, white guy. His family came from Kentucky. Um, <clears throat> and, he, and he was sort of larger than life. You know, there's some people I'm sure you know that, that can just tell stories and they just hold forth and they're, you know, even something mundane, it, it's kind of funny and, and hilarious. And, and, um, uh, and you don't, you know, Nico Case is a little bit like that. It just seems like, how does all this stuff happen to you? You know, and I'm sure you've known people or know people like that. And um, unfortunately, he, as a young man, he seemed to like getting high, and he just kind of succumbed to that. You know, it, 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 I'm, I won't lie; it, it, you know, it was kind of sad towards the end. Um, but it's a it's a choice that you can make. You can, you can like I say, you can choose lifestyle over life. You get plenty of warnings, and the you know if you get hit by a car, then the universe is trying to tell you something. <laughs> you know, it's like it's not just an accident. You gotta, it, it is, but you gotta like Ooh, maybe I should be more careful or think. And you know, country dick, but same thing uh, from the beat farmers. But that's kind of the the role I think uh, a history book. I don't know if this is a hit, but a you know this kind of a book is to let people know about. Jeffrey Lee Pierce, who somebody might not know about, to let people know about the Screamers, who was the, the kind of hidden hero in the last book. Huh. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> is, to, is to, you know, kind of turn people on to it. And unfortunately, Jimmy didn't have a lot of uh, 
recordings. He's got one record that it took Steve Berlin from Los Lobos was the was the producer, and it took like five years after they recorded it to finally get it out. And, you know, not great business sense. And I'm still friends with a couple of the guys from uh, from Jimmy's band. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a couple story. Billy Billy Zoom tells this one story about <laughs> about about Jimmy. Um, Billy had a rock and roll uh, rockabilly band called the Billy Zoom Band um, before he was in X. And he was on the cover of some, or had an um, article in, in the, L, the LA Times, or in a, a, the LA, <coughs> Weekly. couldn't have been the LA Free Press, but it, or in the uh, like Herald Examiner, which was the competitor of the LA Times. And so Jimmy went up to the, to the box, the, the newspaper box, and if you like kick the bottom of it, it would release the latch, and you could pull it open <laughs> and take all the papers. You know? so, being a good friend, because Billy knew Jimmy before anyone else, <coughs> but uh, I, I was really interested in the interview that you have in the book, and it's an interview transcript chapter with Angelo Moore from Fishbone. Um, and that band was so unique and so inspiring to, to a lot of artists, just because uh, they were doing things that really hadn't been done. Uh, but I found it really interesting to hear about LA through his eyes, and you talked about the, the dichotomy of the white LA and black LA. And mm -hmm. Most of the white LA that he, he experienced was through racism when he was walking around just on his day-to-day -day life, but he would go to these punk clubs and feel acceptance and feel a sense of home. Um, and I, I get a sense that that was generally the way things were within the scene, being more inclusive, more accepting and generally more progressive. Um, but I, I mean, is, is that representative of your your experience in that scene during the time? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna whitewash it and say that, oh, it was so, you know, there wasn't any, uh, it, there were so many different people there, you know? Yeah, there was Los Lobos and there was the Brat and there was a, this whole East LA contingent and there were, you know, some, some black folks that were in bands, Carla, uh, Mad Dog was the drummer and the controllers, and but it was you know it was primarily white. But we suffered a certain amount of um, abuse just because we had short hair or wore a leather jacket or had torn jeans and stuff like that. You know, as a city, and, and you know the the kind of uh, stuff that went on here with the uh, T Bone Walker and and stuff like that, which is like showmanship and and not giving a damn. Um, I think that, uh, yes, punk rock from the very beginning, you know, Ramones and Blondie and, and uh, even the Talking Heads to a degree said, okay, this whole seven minute song, no. Big guitar solos, virtuoso, no. <laughs> Heart, soul, three minute song, boom, thank you. And so that's a return to like, roots rock and roll. You know, the Ramones were kind of like uh, a lot of chord changes that, that reminded me of girl groups and, and doo-wop and stuff like that. Um, we were more influenced by maybe Eddie Cochran and Chuck Berry or Little Richard. <clears throat> so you go through, you know, X puts out two or three uh, pretty, or two pretty serious kind of punk rock records. And then we have a little bit more money to, to work with, and so we did a, you know, we have a personal tragedy with Exine's sister, and this song, Come Back to Me, uh, comes in my head. And it's slow, and it's like a R&B song, and Billy plays saxophone, so we said, well, this is gonna be punk rock too. So it's like kind of what you can get away with, and I think that the reason that uh, Loan justice or social distortion, you know, <clears throat> could align themselves with uh, Loretta Lynn or Johnny Cash <clears throat> or Dolly Parton is that they could kind of get away with it. They could they could do it, and it would seem legit. Um, <clears throat> I I don't think we would try to do like a straight up R and B record because it would be kind of yeah, I don't really be I don't <laughs> believe it. Uh, Fishbone could do that because they could they could get away with it. So I think that's how how that happened. And, and you know I, I give Billy Zoom a lot of credit for um, for bringing rockabilly guitars and and that whole vibe to punk rock. I mean Robert Quine did that a little bit with the with the uh, Voidoids, Richard Hell, 
but Billy was the you know first one. It's like he starts off Johnny Hit and Run Pauline with a Chuck Berry flick. It was directly stolen from uh, Promised Land because he played that stuff. He played it in, in his own band. He played with Gene Vincent. It's like oh well, I'm just going to do this because it seems to fit. Cool. Yeah. Um, does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, so, uh, as we've discussed, this, this book is more about sort of the tail end and the decline of that Los Angeles punk rock scene uh, and sort of cultural, cultural change that happened at that time. And, you know, there's that joke about the Motley Crue took over. Um, um, there's also <coughs> theories testosterone came in and just kind of changed the culture in general. But can you think of anything or can you point to anything culturally in, in the scene that you thought might have predicated that change? Uh, well, at the time, I think we were just mad. <clears throat> we were mad that the, uh, you know, our little uh, creative burst of energy and, and community got overtaken by um, more people and, and uh, you know, maybe didn't understand quite as much, but it was just uh, of, of what the scene was about. And, um, but it was just evolution, you know, in, in hindsight. It's like, okay, you play fast, I'll play faster. You play faster, I'll play fastest, and and uh, you know it was it was a drag because like uh, we couldn't go see bands that we had played with like Fear or the Circle Jerks because their audience thought that Exine and I were rock stars or some nonsense like that. <clears throat> so we said, okay, fine, you know we'll go see Lone Justice, we'll go see you know uh, the Crusados, we'll go see uh, Los Lobos, and you know. Um, I, I don't know if it was a uh, Reagan era stuff. I mean, that we t I touch on that a little bit in the book, but um, it was just I, I have a theory that like there's a, a really creative um, explosion, and then and then there's a uh, so settling down to, to something that's a little more comfortable, like psychedelia, and then you know the uh, like alt country, you know. Uh, Buffalo Springfield and, and the birds doing their more country stuff and then there's like punk rock and then there's something that's a little more settled down but um, I uh, I think it's natural yeah and it did give us did give, give I don't think it was a, a it, it doesn't going into the destruction of or decline of the LA scene it's just like a branching out and <clears throat> you know there's a couple of very brave chapters from Charlotte Caffey about uh, addiction and recovery. Uh, she's been sober for like 35 years, but she had a kind of dark secret as, as the Go-Go's were you know, at the top of the charts. Um, so it's like a reckoning of sorts, and, and it, it did allow people to kind of branch out and, and influence others. Sure, and that's, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I thought that was one of the more interesting things about the book in, in the timeline of where the scene was. Um, you know, the, the first book is kind of more towards the, the beginning of the scene and these, these artists becoming more known on a national scale. And this sort of starts to pick up where you've got these once fledgling artists are now uh, have label deals, now have national touring. And it seems like there's a lot of content in this book about the inner conflict that those artists dealt with. And that uh, a lot of the initial uh, you know, punk rock ethos was about fighting against the establishment, and some of these artists like Jane Weaveland, for instance, said, you know, we used to give the finger to the establishment, we became the establishment. Um, and there's a, little, there's a little bit of that as well in, in your discussion about Ain't Love Grand, uh, recording that, that album. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the perception that I have is that it, it was very difficult to, to maintain credibility as a band in, in the punk rock ethos, but also be a successful band. Um, and so I wondered if you know, or if you have any ideas on how a band could have navigated that, and if you could go back to give advice to anybody, what would you say? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very seductive. You know, if you, if you get into a bigger game, <clears throat> there's someone who's going to say, you know, if you do this, you might get that. You know, it's, th that is pretty, yeah. You know, and then other people were just, so, with us, we kind of started believing the reviews. And we started believing that, oh, you're gonna be the next big thing, and oh, if you go with Electra, then your records will actually be in record stores when you go to the <coughs> town, which they were. And with the first two records, they weren't. And that sucked. You know, you're, you're out there working hard and nobody can buy your record. Okay, fine. We'll keep doing it. 
Um, luckily, we still could maintain some credibility because we never had one uh, bona fide or validated hit. You know? <clears throat> so, and the other people are just thrust into it. You know, the Go-Go's didn't change their, their music that much. They just kind of cleaned up their image and, and, and their, you know, Miles Copeland from IRS Records was smart enough to say, let's just put this on the, you know, DL, not talk about your punk rock roots and you're just America's sweethearts. So, yeah, they're, they're living this uh, schizophrenic sort of life. And Maria McKee, in Low Justice, they're playing at the Palomino, which is a, in this, uh, uh, you know, honky tonk up in the San Fernando Valley, and then they're opening for U2, and she's being compared to Dolly Parton and you know Linda Ronstadt and and all these other people. It's like, and she's 19. She's got nobody to kind of. You know, Chris Stein and I had this uh, conversation. Uh, around his books and our and, and my and our book and he, he said that you know and, and we shared this thing that like well Debbie had him and Exine had me and it wasn't like the you know protector man but it was it was someone that could kind of deflect some of that and and you know some people didn't have that and, and it was that much harder you know at least you could say god that sucked right yeah that sucked or um, in a business meeting, I could defer to Exine and say, well, what do you think? And and I do that to this day, you know, with my partner, when we're talking to, to people and, and somebody's like, just focused on me. And it's like, do you know that this person is like, we're connected and she's here? Like, look at her, dumbass. <laughs> Direct a question to her. I mean, it's like, fine, I understand you might, you know, but that's a, that's gonna be, like our children's children that may get over that. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> um, one of the things that's talked about a lot in, in both the forward and the, 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 a lot of the individual parts of the book are about the legacy that this scene left. Um, you know, if you could choose what that is, what history looks at this scene as, what the punk rock scene in LA is to the future generations. Uh, what do you think that is, and what do you hope it is? Well, it's you'll have to read the book in order to find it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I I said this before, and I'll say it again: is I think that Girls Rock Camp grew up, and there's a lot of women that are in current bands that are like playing drums, playing bass, <coughs> playing guitar, writing songs, not just the you know pretty front to it because they uh, started like 10 15 years ago so they were 10 and now they're 20 or 25 and they're you know and they're going to see bikini kill you know because they're playing again and, and stuff like that so um, I think the I think music nowadays is is alive and well it's hard to break through the static but the music business may be in the toilet because of all the you know Spotify and streaming and stuff like that, but people are trying to get a handle on that. Big surprise, the musicians are getting the short end of the deal. And I wouldn't care if, you know, Spotify and Pandora weren't multi, multi million dollar companies that you know, get a bunch of advertising and subscriptions. So spread it around. It's it's a little deflating to get a, a royalty statement from ASCAP or one of the or BMI and it says twenty thousand plays. Here's Two hundred dollars, or twenty dollars? No, it's twenty dollars. Two thousand, twenty thousand is two is twenty dollars. It's like one thousandth of a cent. You just used three minutes of our content. You just took up three minutes on the air of somebody enjoying something, and you're going to pay me one thousandth of a cent? Come on, that ain't right, you know. Anyway. I think there, that may change, whatever. But um, that's what I hope, I, that's the, the point that I say when those are coming up behind us. It is, it is part of the, a continuum. Well, uh, I really want to thank you for allowing us to ask you some questions. I'd like to open it up if you're okay with it to Absolutely. people in the audience here if they have questions. What do you think of the NIMS 
What do I think of the knitters? I think the knitters are great. <laughs> uh, Tom DeSavia uh, says that uh, he used to have to, his dad was a big country western fan. And he used to have to hide his Merle Haggard records in the closet. Oh, and then when Rank and File and Lone Justice started playing, then he could bring country music out of the closet. <laughs> uh, so. I, I wish the Nairs played more, but X is really busy, Dave Alvin's pretty busy, and so you never know, but it, it was it was good to be part of that, you know, to turn people on to the Carter family or Merle Haggard, and, and there are, you know, some 20-somethings who are going like, oh, this is kind of radical, cool. <laughs> yes? So tonight, when you play as X, will you do any Nairs songs, or is that totally separate from X? It's separate, yeah. Um, I do some knitter songs uh, on occasion solo, yeah. but uh, with the X show, we, we have another player that, that comes along with us now, and we do a, a few songs that, that we never played but when they were on record. Um, DJ plays vibes, Billy plays sax on a few songs. Uh, we do like Come Back to Me and um, I Must Not Think Bad Thoughts, which we never played before. Yeah, yes? Um, more like a comment, uh, born and raised in LA, Hollywood, and Normandy, and Melrose. Mm -hmm. Grew up with you and the rest of them listening to it, um, going, sneaking into the anti club. And good. <laughs> sneaking into any club is good. <laughs> um, just want to say thank you. Uh, huge, huge yeah, yeah. influence as far as a kids who grew up in Hollywood who didn't have, we were kind of the misfits, didn't have anything to go to because South Central had rap. The Valley kind of had their own new wave-ish thing. And we in Eagle Rock and Silver Lake and all that didn't really have that. And so it's a huge... Silver Lake was just, nobody knew what Silver Lake was no, now. No, and now it's insane. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm really flattered. Yeah, and, thank you. And I'm grateful that, that you seem to turn out pretty good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. if, if you're, I mean, imagine if the tables were turned. Yeah. If I was saying that to you, and, and I take it um, yeah. as, a, as a deep compliment, and, yeah. and anybody whose eyes get opened up and mind gets opened up, I'm yeah. all for it. And we saw you at um, Punk Rock Bowl last year. And oh yeah, you, Punk Rock Bowling's fun. You guys, it <laughs> was amazing because a lot of the younger who didn't really know kind of spread it out, and there was bunch of us who just kind of <laughs> gravitated towards <laughs> the stage and it was you guys did a great job teach those young ones thing yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> thanks thank you yeah you yeah oh yeah um so I get this lady comments but also i'm super inspired by your longevity and in the true punk ethos that you have do you ever like see yourself slowing down at all or are you just kind of like rock and roll for the what, what else am I going to do? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to, well, I'm, I'm going to write another book, maybe, but um, I still like touring. I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. I know other people that are musicians, and they don't really like performing. <coughs> they like making records and things, so we're lucky in, in that we, also X is lucky that we like each other enough yeah. to continue to do it. You know, there's, there I think now, like Cheap Trick and us and Los Lobos, we're kind of like the blues musicians of the past. Mm -hmm. We just go out there and do our thing, and yeah. you know, luckily we get paid better. And if we didn't get paid, you know, a, a decent, uh, make a decent living, I don't think, or if there weren't young people that we could that we saw at the show, and or if it was fifty people that showed up, we might not do it. So we're we're pretty grateful about that. So the answer is no. <laughs> yeah? Um, I'm from Los Angeles as well. We actually played at my college in 1988. Nice. called Wednesday Week. I'm wondering, do you remember that? I, I don't. <laughs> what, was the, what was the college? Uh, University of Laverne. <laughs> About 300 people in there in the gym. It was pretty cool. Nice. <laughs> uh, what was your favorite uh, place to play in Los Angeles? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, the Whiskey A Go Go had, its, had, had a moment that was really wonderful. Um, but that was kind of short lived. 
there was a Stardust Ballroom, which mm -hmm. was at the uh, east end of Sunset, that was pretty pretty wide open. Um, we never, I don't think we ever played at the uh, Olympic. I went to a couple shows there. I sort of more enjoyed going to the the T Birds, which is a you know the early roller derby. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's just it depends on the on the moon and the audience and the night and the you know whatever yeah. we've had a lot of good good opportunities yeah and one more plug for the book there's some great photographs of some of those clubs uh mid-concert and just looking at them i start sweating <laughs> <laughs> there actually was a there's a, a documentary that's being made about the olympic auditorium is it? which is now a oh, church. Yeah, korean. korean church yeah yeah but it's still there it didn't get knocked down so but there's a really great documentary being made about it. all the early boxing days and the and the woman Aileen something or other I can't remember who was kind of the boss of that place. Yeah. And uh, you know they had wrestling and then roller derby and then punk rock and it's like all blood sport. It's <laughs> L. A. Yeah. I heard a rumor that you and I sing Matthew Bryan's new X songs. Yes. We're Exceed and I are writing some new songs. We did some recording in uh, January. We got it mixed, and hopefully there's going to be a, a single out uh, sometime this year. Fat Possum <coughs> reissued our uh, first four <coughs> records because we got the masters back. You can do that now. After 25 years, you can reclaim the masters, and that's good, you know, financial uh, sense too. Um, so hopefully by you know mid next. Mid year next year, we'll have a uh, either an EP or something more done. Yeah, evidently hell has frozen over. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do you have plans to do anything more, kind of that Kickstarter, um, like when you did uh, with X, the Live in Latin America, and I've seen all these other bands you just kind of cut out the middleman. I'm curious if that worked well for you, and if that's something you're going to repeat in the future. Because I personally really like the direct to artist model. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, we, we did that because we wanted, we, we had all these tapes and we needed someone to go through them and, you know, mix them. And, and that's actually how we started working with the guy, Rob Schnapp, who recorded the new stuff. We did three old songs and uh, one kind of reimagined song, one new song that are, that are done now. I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up with the band. <laughs> take it to committee. <laughs> yeah? What, yep. How accepting were you of the term punk to start out with? You've given several names for the style, of what they call the styles of music, and 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 yeah. of course that changed once the British punk happened. Yeah. The different crowds that would probably come in. Uh, the question is how how um, accepting of the term punk was I uh, or we? Because <clears throat> I'll bring the rest of the bands in, and at the beginning it was it was fine because it separated you from uh, bands like The Knack, and, which were New Wave, and, and that was kind of like an old model, an old model of how to get music out there. Or what, you know, and it separated you from people that had been around forever. But then it became sort of being ghettoized, you know, like, oh, you can't play that um, because it's punk. Um, right now, I, I'm fine with it, you know. I mean, some people, uh, fight against it, like Nico fights against the, the term, or has fought against the term all country, because she wants to be just who she is. Mm -hmm. I can dig that. Um, yeah, it's it's better than being new wave. <laughs> <laughs> so that, well, that, you know, and unfortunately, like bands like the Plimsolls and the Nerves, who were, Peter Case was in, were really great, and they didn't they didn't really get there, except maybe they wore kind of like British suits or something, right. you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, that's cool. A couple more. Yes, sir. I saw in Iowa City back in the 80s, and I think Tony Yeah. I was playing with you guys at the time. Are you guys, is he still involved? Or is this, is this no, it's, uh, Tony is, is doing stuff in LA. He's still, uh, Tony Gilkison played with X for about, about 10 years. Yeah. Wow. And uh, <laughs> Billy was, uh, just didn't want to continue the, the cycle of, you know, record and tour and record and tour. And then uh, like 99, Billy, you know, we did a, a, a uh, anthology with Electra and Billy said, sure, let's, let's do it again. And he's still playing with us and 
his health is holding up. He's had a couple of bouts of cancer, but he's good. Yeah, all original members, like last man standing, <laughs> gunfighters. Awesome. Yes, sir. Uh, I saw the thing for him last night. Uh, and the twenty oh, is, uh, is is Dead Rock West playing with you tonight as well? Dead Rock West is playing with us tonight. Okay. Folkyuk is playing with us in Omaha. If you want to drive okay. to Omaha. Um, both bands are duos, and they're amazing. I've, I've had the good fortune to work with, um, with Dead Rock. Like you when you do your solo yes. stuff. Yes, Cindy Wasserman covers. sings with me uh, when I do some solo stuff, and, and Dead Rock West, I, I made a record with them uh, called More Love, and it's it's kind of the, uh, it sounds a little bit like the, the California sound of, uh, of the mid-60s. So uh, they're wonderful, wonderful singers, really emotional. Uh, yeah, so don't go to Fishbone and George <laughs> Clinton. <Clemens. laughs> it's, it's a good choice, it's a hard choice. I think there was one more, I, I might have missed yep. it earlier, sorry. That's, that's right. Now go ahead. Um, I had an opportunity to go to Bob Dylan with my dad. To what? Uh, Bob Dylan. Totally Bob Dylan. Yeah. It was a life changing experience because I literally saw a son of my dad that I never knew. Yeah. And to be there and take in that experience, and now it sucked that the concert was on a weeknight, so I had to go to work the next day. But man, you talk about a high experience. It was high, both emotional and then from a contact standpoint. <laughs> right. Because there was a lot of smoke in that arena. Yeah. Do you feel sometimes at that regard that the music can also take you back no matter what age or venue you go to? And just in just kind of like a reflective sense. Yeah, uh, I think music is one of those, uh, like smell is one of those things that transports you. You know, uh, Billy was actually talking about, um, you know, that it like old motorcycles, uh, you had to have you had to mix oil into the gas. Yeah. And he said whenever he smells that and beer, he just immediately <laughs> thinks of his dad. <laughs> and dad's in the room. <laughs> So yes, I think the music definitely has that, and, and it, it has this uh, sound and and vision that is internal that somehow transports you. Um, and we see generations, you know, father and daughter, mother, son, whatever, uh, at our shows now, and that's that's inspiring. When I see some, you know, sixteen-year-old woman looking at Xane, going like, "Damn, she's ferocious." I think, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> but she's inspiring you, and she's like a role model, and it's like, yeah, that's, I'll, I'll keep doing this. As long as you're here, I'll be here. You know? Okay, so I think we're going to sign some books. Yeah, we've been John for a while. One more, one more last question, if there's one more last question. You've got to spend a lot of time now. There's really no comparison to, from Austin to Los Angeles, except it doesn't freeze that much. Uh, now Austin's Austin's great. It's, it, I, I moved there a couple of years ago. It's a very livable city. Um, it's kind of hilarious when people complain about traffic yeah. in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> but they're you know, in their defense, it's a lot worse than it used to be. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a there's a really big underground music scene in LA right now, from, from what I hear. And, um, and Austin is like, I don't know, the live music center of the world or something they, they call it, you know. So in that way, there's a lot of music in both, yeah. All right, I'm gonna go sign some books and thank you all for coming. Thank you.